of low-tech, high-tech, we do a very thorough examination, and just the physical examination is probably 30 minutes where we're, we're checking many neurological things. But we also use the max pulse because we want to know how their circulation is doing. We do the heart rate variability because we want to know what their nervous system is doing. We do the Thyroflex, which is going to give us uh, thyroid readings. We use a device called the right eye, which is an infrared camera that measures eye movement and our eye movements are controlled by the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the parietal and the frontal cortex. So just by uh, having people look at things left and right, up and down, we can tell how their brain is functioning. We use a, something called the balance tracks, and in that we can quantitatively evaluate their, their balance compared to their peers uh, and their age group. And the other thing we can do is we can assess the canals in the ear. So we got three canals in the ear. Uh, one measures acceleration in this plane, one is up and down, and the other is what we call yaw, side to side. So that's part of our vestibular system, keeps us upright. And again, this is something that we can check with this, and then we can uh, quantitate it and treat it. We use an interactive metronome, which is a cowbell in the ears, but it, it's checked. Uh, evaluates the synchrony between the cerebellum, parietal, and frontal cortex. And then we also use brain mapping, which we do uh, questionnaires on neural behavior and also cognitive function. So again, we use the Melillo method as far as an evaluation. We're looking at tone symmetry. We're looking at primitive reflexes. We're looking at core strength. We're looking at growth strength. And then we're, again, we're looking at the uh, vestibular system, the balance the canals, oculomotor, optokinetic, visual system. I want to talk a little bit about primitive reflexes. You know, I think I, I, I knew about primitive reflexes. I think I was at a brain tap conference and there was a, Dr. Nancy was talking about brain uh, primitive reflexes maybe three or four years ago. And I can be honest, I just, I was very confused from that. Um, so this is something that you can do in like three or four minutes. And I would just really encourage all the practitioners, this is something you, that you need to start checking. Because the significance of these primitive reflexes is they're necessary for survival and they live in the brainstem, in other words, where they come from. And they should go away by six months, eight months, different ones, you know, different times, but certainly by a year, they should be gone. And this is, when they are gone, that means they're integrated into the brainstem. And the, this is the beginning of the polyvagal or the parasympathetic nervous system. So when people don't have, when they still have primitive reflexes, their parasympathetic system is not functioning correctly, right? So you're going to have an oversympathetic because when we're born, we only have a sympathetic nervous system. When these primitive reflexes are integrated, that's when we start developing the parasympathetic. And these will create certain neuro neural behaviors and doing functional medicine for years, I would have people with like leaky gut or different situ situations and we just couldn't resolve them. And now that same patient, the reason is, is because they had primitive reflexes and, and that system was undeveloped. So this is something you can go on YouTube. I've got on my YouTube station, I've got an examination, but this is something that really, really important to start checking out on patients. So again, we're looking at core strength. We do, uh, we look at their pelvic lift. Can they do a side plank? Can they do uh, like a Superman? We also have them do like sit-ups and push-ups. And there's, there's quantitative data for that. And I can just tell you if you have a chronic brain problem and you do not fix these primitive reflexes and you do not address their core strength, you will never fix the problem. I've, I've done this enough that I, I'm just telling you, you've got, to, you've got to do those two things. So again, we're looking at the uh, balance. So we're doing, a, this is basically looking a lot of if, uh, function of the cerebellum and we get a lot of quantitative data off the balance tracks as well. But the what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to, in this physical examination, we're trying to determine the weaker cerebellar 
side, which is going to be opposite the weaker frontal cortex. Okay, so if you have a, in the older people, they have a left frontal cortex, most of them are going to have a right cerebellum weakness. And we're going to put in, input to the right side to the cerebellum and crosses over to the frontal cortex. So left hemispheric weakness, right sensory input, right hemispheric weakness, left sensory input. Of course, we can do all this. Um, you know, we can look at their eyes and you'll see different things, but it's really hard to pick up a lot of these things. And that's why like the right eye, we also, I'm gonna show you another little device that's pretty inexpensive that you can uh, video the eye movements and pick up much more. So I want to talk a little bit about the vestibular system here because this is part of what we're looking at with the canals and the balance. And chronic pain patients. So I know there's some of our, many of our listeners are chiropractors, chronic neck pain, chronic back pain, and what I can tell you is that and from the research and what we find is that they have a vestibular problem and that's affecting these intrinsic muscles because the vestibular spinal tract is really what, what maintains the tone and balance and strength of these small muscle groups. And lots of times we'll see like in someone who's in a car crash, whiplash type injury, they have a sprain strain, but the really the chronic issue is they have a vestibular problem because their eyes are off and they're looking at computer screens and things, and this is causing a, a chronic spasm and balance in their neck muscles. So again, this is a uh, another study, and I just want to point this out. I said before that depression is usually a left hemispheric weakness, and here's a research showing that people who had 80% of these patients who had chronic depression had a hypoactivity in the right vestibular pathways in their brainstem. Okay. So again, that is, that's going to come up over here and cross over. So again, this is just showing an involvement in the vestibular system, why we want to look at that and why we want to get that better for patients. So this is one of our younger patients who, uh, his grandfather I was treating for some cognitive decline he brought in, he was having uh, school problems. And so this is this little camera, we can watch his eye movement here. Oops. Okay. So again, the eyes should be symmetrically, we can always see his right eye is kind of inward a little bit there. And he's going to go through some eye movement here and a bit. Not quite sure why we're not seeing that. There we go. Okay. So basically, we're just having the person go look, have the patient go left, right, left, right with their eyes, and then up and down, up and down with their eyes. And we'll see some asymmetry here. So what I want you to get from this is this abnormal eye movement is not a muscle problem. It's not a cranial nerve problem. It's a whole brain problem. It's a problem in their cerebellum. It's a problem in their frontal cortex. So when we look at that, say we saw a deviation right there. Okay. But that's a, that's a, actually, I think that device is like seven or $50. So it's not a super expensive thing, but it's, it's a great visual. Anytime we can show a patient, you know, visual. So here's our right eye. One of our older patients, this is a um, gentleman is a 88 year old CEO, multi-million dollar company comes in just to stay because he still wants to be running running the show at the office. So this is a kind of report from the right eye and it's measuring, it's giving an overall score from zero to 100 eye score. So 38 is not very good. Pursuits, that means that's like watching a train go by. You know, you're just watching a continual motion, movement 
of things. Saccade, that's like you're, you're in traffic and you're looking to the left, looking to the right, looking to the left. That's a saccade, moving from place to place. And then fixation is the ability just to focus on one area. So on this individual, had this test, the pursuits are very poor and th that is controlled from this part of the brain. So again, we get an idea. And more importantly, then we can see, uh, you can see in the picture of the brain here, their areas are red. When we implement interventions, then this is another objective tool we can use to show that there's improvement in the brain function. So we'll have many people, I've had some people go from 38 to 80 over, uh, over a couple months period. So this is just, I'm gonna show you a little bit live action. The cool thing about this test is you can actually replay this for a patient. So you can actually show eye movement. So this is what this individual's left and right eye are doing watching a something just go round and round in a perfect circle. So they're not, they're not working very well, are they? So again, we see a difference. So horizontal tracking measures serotonin levels. So if someone has a problem like this, they probably have some serotonin problems. And again, serotonin is inhibitory. It's a calmer down of the brain. Okay, here's our heart rate variability and using the max pulse, same time. Again, for, if, for any of you out there who's not, who are dealing with people, uh, this is just one of the tools you've got to get from Patrick. Uh, you know, he makes these available at a very reasonable price. It's got great graphics. It tells you like 12 different things that are going on in, in the brain, but this is just a piece of a pie and, and the green is the parasympathetic, the rest digest, the yellow is the sympathetic fight flight, and the red is the neurohormonal response. So normally these should be fairly, uh, you know, like a third, third, and third. And again, based on different activities, you know, we can get stressed, you could, one is gonna go up and go down. But what we see a lot is this picture on the right. See that little tiny sliver in the green? That's the people's parasympathetic system. So they got no potential for healing, repair, and mend. They're going to have dichronic digestive problems. They're going to have immune problems. They're going to have sleeping problems. So this is just a, a, a max pulse. It shows four different functional cardiovascular assessments. The DPI on the lower right, we're looking at, I'll use my cursor here. Let's just think of overall heart function. So this is um, in the 22 percentile. So if 50% of, of us are going to die of cardiovascular complications, we don't want to be in the, in the, the bottom quartile. Eccentric contraction, the left atrium. So that's just pushing the blood out. Again, very poor. Arterial elasticity. And this is when this actually was done uh, by my spouse, Dr. Hoff, when I first got your brain tap. I don't know, this is when I came in, I brought this device. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that was, three or four years ago. But she was going through a bad time. Her mom was in a uh, nursing home and uh, assisted living and was failing. And her favorite 14 year old poodle, her fourth poodle, was on the way out and she and was she was up all night and uh, she wasn't sleeping well. So AE is arterial elasticity, 38% and then RBV is remaining blood volume. Look at her stress score. Look at, this is her blood vessel, the intima and in her blood vessel. So this family history of cardiovascular problem, this is not a good readings here. This is, the same readings on the left that I just showed you, a, a smaller, I, I went in there. And this is 20 minutes later. See the timestamp? What is that? 17 and plus 11, 28 minutes later, she did a one brain tap session and we got 100% improvement in overall heart function. A 300% efficiency in the, the contraction of her left atrium. 
100% plus improvement in our arterial elasticity. Now this is big. Arterial elasticity is a major predictor for future cardiovascular events. So if you can change arterial elasticity, this is where all the stuff about nitric oxide, you know, produce production and trying to get the intima to producing more. So this is huge. And this is, this is done. All we did was calm her brain down with, I think she did a stress reduction or something like enchanted for us. One of those. So what it is calmed her brain down. So her brain controls the physiology. So there's no doubt that people have strokes and heart attacks every day because they've got, they can't de-stress their brain. So this is just the Thyroflex. We has this little hammer that we check the brachioradialis reflex. It measures the speed. Ideally, it's 50 to 100 milliseconds. If it's over the 100 milliseconds, you've got not enough T3 in the cells. So again, this individual's had 187 milliseconds. Again, a hypothyroid patient. So here we have brain mapping. This is one of the uh, major tools. We have uh, nine, 18... Uh, excuse me, 19 points of reference here. And uh, we'll show you what that looks like. So this is delta waves. So we talked about delta waves not being good in the uh, heart rate variability. We see a spike a lots of times in people in their delta waves. And this is a confirmation. So again, delta waves are slow brain wave. That's when we're in our deepest sleep. So if we have an abundance of these delta waves, that, that, that means like we're trying to drive the car and we got the parking brake on. And that's really how what's happening with our brain. And this is secondary to uh, traumatic brain injuries. You're gonna get a lot of this. You'll also get it with food, chemical, allergy sensitivities, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, plastics. And again, I wanna emphasize chronic infections in the brain. So again, this is something we'll see in uh, the ADHD kid many times, a lot of high delta, but also in the aging brain. Another thing that the brain mapping shows is uh, asymmetry, imbalance. So generally speaking, our left frontal cortex or left half should be a little more beta a little stronger in beta and our right half should be a little stronger in alpha. So when we have the opposite, like in this individual, instead of being the beta on the left, it's on the right. Then we, that creates anxiety and the anxiety, if it goes long enough, it will, it will turn into uh, depression. So this, we see this abnormality in beta and alpha all the time. So here we're going to talk about treatments now. What do we do? We've done all these assessments. Now, how do we fix the brain? So one of the things we do is we, primary, we're going to get rid of the primitive reflexes. There's different exercises for that. We use the shed light laser on different uh, parts of the brain. The, uh, why it, I, we like that is because it will do infrared and red light and it will do different frequencies so we can use a red light at 10 hertz and the brain stem and the cerebellum and we can do infrared and 40 hertz for the frontal cortex different frequencies different types of light they respond better this is one 85 year old guy i've got a video up of him doing his core strength on my uh, youtube station so he's an inspiration, 85 year olds. He's in his exercise class with 60 year olds. He kicks their ass. So he's Superman. Here's another one of our 80 year old places, uh, patients doing uh, just some rehab on the balance. And again, if you can see on the screen, he's actually doing uh, angular things. So he's going left to right and, and, and like a big cross here. So we can do left, right, front, back. We can do moving circles, moving targets. And again, this is helping this person integrate, getting their brain and their feet coordinated. And of course, our tool is one of the things we do is 
every patient goes home with a brain tap. So this is part of every patient's brain rehab program. And what we do from the brain mapping uh, is we use different frequencies. So many times the patient will have a global uh, problem with, uh, let's say they got too much delta. So we wanna do alpha to speed up their brain or they may have a deficiency in beta. So we wanna do SMR to strengthen that. So most of our patients have one or two global uh, apps that we want to really pound with the brain tap. And they also, many of them will have a left and right. So in the, in the brain tap under new mind training, we have for the beta imbalance, we have a left 15 to 20 Hertz and a right 12 to 15 to get the beta more on the left. And then we also have a app where we do uh, 15 to 20 Hertz beta on the left and we're doing nine to 11 of alpha on the right. We're gonna work on some more programs, but sometimes the alpha is too high. We might just wanna bring it down a bit or we wanna speed it up. So we can do all that with the apps on the brain tap. So I love that tool and uh, we're very happy with what we're able to accomplish with patients with that. Uh, this is just showing uh, one of the graphics on the, on the uh, heart rate variability that we use. This is an Alzheimer patient. And this is, again, the timestamp is like 40 minutes. So this was after a rehab session. So this is when she came in and uh, it was like 10, 10%. And when she finished, it was 81. It was like an 800% improvement in her brainwave activity. So another tool that we use is neurofeedback. And again, what we do from the brain mapping is uh, after we get the information is we will put that into the brain tap and home therapy, and then we'll target specific areas in the brain so if you look at this picture over here, we might be doing the frontal cortex. Okay, we might use, uh, these are lateral, these, all these are on the frontal cortex where we might use a temporal or a parietal or an occipital. Again, based off the information and what part of the brain is the most imbalanced and we're trying to, to do that. So this has visual feedback. So when the brain is functioning, um, not as well, the picture is going to get darker. When the, when the brain is functioning better, the picture is going to get brighter. And it also has an auditory feedback, which is particularly good for autistic children. And again, the sound is going up and down based on the brain and the brain is built for survival. So it will self-correct. It will try to see better and try to hear better by performing those better brainwave frequencies. This interactive metronome, again, this helps reset the timing and synchrony between the cerebellum, uh, parietal, and the frontal cortex. This is one of our stroke patients who was uh, paralyzed on her right side for three years where we actually we started doing hemispheric sensory input and we were able to get her arm and leg moving again, which she hadn't done for three years, just in a few sessions. So this is a interactive 55 inch touchscreen do a hundred different job functions on it. So again, we do a lot of that off the cognitive testing and the different testing we'll use, we'll do specific exercises to strengthen that weakened area of the brain. So it's really about finding the weak areas and that's the real key to the, the brain is trying to find the weak areas and try to be as specific as, as possible. This is another uh, called NeuroSage. This was developed by Kyle Daigle and uh, Robert Melillo and uh, Brandon Crawford have also had a lot of input to this. Uh, Brandon Crawford has a shed light laser. So this young individual is actually getting treatment to the right cerebellum. There's actually another laser over here treating his left frontal cortex, but he is um, doing one of the games so that they also have 3D capability with this technology. So again, this is another interaction of getting sensory input through the ears. We put patients on the vibration plate with this as well. And uh, 